Strong enamel is your best defense against erosion and cavities. Reinforce that defense with new Pernamel Active Shield. Live radio done right. No ads, no subscription fees. Totally free. Hi, my name is Paul. I want to tell you a story about how we blew up a frog with a firecracker. I...
up in the suburbs of Chicago in the 70s and 80s. We had a lot of freedom back then. So from a fairly young age, kids like me spent a lot of time doing things on their own. We would play at the park without adult supervision. We would ride our bikes to the store, to the video arcade, to the swimming pool. And sometimes, a lot of times, we did things the adults didn't approve of. Every weekend in the summertime, my family used to go camping at a privately owned family campground. It was a very big place, and it was a lot of fun. But it wasn't strictly camping. We actually owned the lot we camped on. So we had a large camping trailer that was parked there all year round. And it had all the comforts of home. We had electricity, we had hot and cold running water, we had a toilet, a shower, we had air conditioning, we had everything. We even had an Atari. The campground itself was more like a camping resort. There was a beach, two swimming pools, we had an arcade, a grocery store, playgrounds, athletic areas, tennis courts, an outdoor amphitheater, this thing they called the pavilion. Even so, we did a lot of camping activities. We would go build fires, roast marshmallows and hot dogs and fire. We'd go fishing at the lake, hiking, boating. There was a lot of nature too. It was lots of fun. My favorite thing to do was explore the wild areas, especially the different wet environments, like the lakes, the streams, the crisscrossing. When I was really young, probably about five, my dad took me along to go fishing once. As we walked along the lakeside, there would be these splashes in the water as we walked by. Not just one or two, but as we walked, it seemed like every other second, there was a splash in the water right next to us. I asked my dad what these were, and he said, those are frogs. When we come walking, we scare them, and they jump into the water to get away. I was fascinated. He told me that if I crept up on the frogs very quietly, I could probably catch one. I didn't really understand what he meant, so he showed me. He crouched down and moved very stealthily forward, being careful not to make any noise. He crept toward the water's edge. He cautiously leaned over the bank. There, he spotted a little frog in the bank, basking in the sunshine. Dad quickly scooped it up with his hand. See, there's nothing to it. While my dad fished that afternoon, I spent my time also creeping stealthily up and down the bank, peering between the reeds, scooping up little frogs, and dumping them into a bucket. When it was time to go back to our camper, Dad set all my frogs free. What are you going to do with them? Eat them? I didn't really have an answer. I didn't know what to do with them. So I wasn't upset. It was easy to catch frogs. From time to time, I would bring friends camping with me. Sometimes I would bring one of my cousins. One of my favorite cousins was Mike. Mike was a little older than me. Once, when I was about eight, Mike came camping with my family and went frog hunting with me. We grabbed a couple dozen little frogs with our bare hands and put them in a big yellow bucket. Then we took them back to the little fort we had made out of sticks and grass clippings. We gave all the little frogs names and we picked them up by their little froggy arms and made them do little froggy song and dance routines on the edge of the bucket. We laughed till our sides hurt. That evening, we covered up the bucket so our pals did not escape. We were surprised in the morning when we found the lid was still on the bucket, but all our frogs were gone. Years later, I found out my mom had felt sorry for the frogs, and she set them free. That was probably a good idea. Years later, when I had kids of my own, they caught some baby toads and kept them in a dry fish tank. Unfortunately, they forgot about the toads for a few days and returned to find they had dried up like little toad-flavored raisins. I could have saved both those toads and my kids a good deal of misery by secretly setting the toads free. Anyway, Mike came camping with me again the next year. For some reason, we were having trouble catching the frogs with our bare hands. We never figured out why we suddenly sucked at grabbing frogs. But I remember thinking I'd lost my touch or something. Fortunately, we had this big net, and we could use it to scoop up 
big areas of weeds and hopefully catch some frogs. We tended to get a lot of other stuff in the net, too. There were water snails, crayfish, weird bugs, and fat tadpoles. And the tadpoles were big. Each of the tadpoles was a bit smaller than a chicken egg. We kept a bunch of the tadpoles in a bucket as we walked around the lake hunting for frogs. As we made our way along the shore, we eventually reached a rocky area. We started throwing the tadpoles around at each other and dashing them on the rocks. They made a real satisfying splat. And we giggled to ourselves as we smashed them. It was quite a mess. The tadpole guts were all over the place. The next year, Mike told me that the incident had given him nightmares. He dreamed that giant tadpoles were coming after him. He never much cared to go frog hunting after that. One of my other favorite cousins was Joey. Joey was a little younger than me. His family also had a camper at the same campground. So I saw Joey a lot in the summertime. Joey loved to go fishing. He really watched the fishes and frogs and seemed to understand their little minds and knew just exactly how to catch them. It's no surprise that he eventually became a fishing boat captain. And Joey used to catch frogs on his fishing pole. He was so good at it, he could get a frog to bite on a bare hook. I always thought he was pretty amazing at that. He was able to reel in big bullfrogs with his fishing pole. My little brother Frankie and I were not so good at catching frogs, or fish for that matter. The only luck we had catching big bullfrogs was at night with a flashlight. Some old guy had told us about the technique. You go out at night with a flashlight, and when you spot a frog in the water, you shine the light in the frog's eyes. They freeze. And so long as you keep the light shining in their eyes, they won't move. Then you just wade into the water and grab them. It sounded a bit far-fetched, but we tried it, and it worked. We just shined the light in their eyes, walked out into the water, and grabbed the frogs. I never caught so many big bullfrogs. Now, the big bullfrogs were really disgusting. Joey and I never really had any feelings of pity for the frogs. Frogs are basically heartless creatures. If a frog was big enough to eat you whole, he wouldn't hesitate or feel the least bit sorry. The feeling of having you struggle inside his gut as you slowly suffocated would not register as anything worth thinking about to a frog. And big frogs eat little frogs, of course. And without remorse. It's really a frog-eat-frog -frog world out there. One time, Joey and I watched a big frog swallow a fish that looked even bigger than the frog. We never forgot that. We thought it explained why lures that looked like frogs never seemed to work to catch any fish. We got up to some pretty outrageous stuff with the frogs. One time, Joey's family was gathering around the campfire, chilling out, just enjoying the night, roasting a few marshmallows, Kicking back with a few beers, Joey, Frankie, and I came walking up from the lake like fishy-smelling specters in the night. Joey had caught a huge bullfrog with his fishing pole. He walked up to the fire, looked around at everyone, and tossed that huge bullfrog right in the fire. Mr. Froggy came leaping out of the flames in a hurry, as Joey would say, hop, hop, hop. The adults and Joey's sisters jumped up and yelled at Joey, while Frankie and I staggered around in the weeds, nearly choking and peeing ourselves from laughter. Meanwhile, Joey located the singed frog and tossed him in again. Mr. Froggy jumped out a little less enthusiastically the second time. But after that, the adults had had enough. They ordered Joey to finish the frog off, which he did by tossing him in the fire one last time. And this time, Mr. Froggy did not get out. We watched as his skin blistered and his eyes bulged and popped. And Mr. Froggy turned to a crisp in the midst of the burning coals. I don't know what is worse, but one time we blew up a frog with a firecracker. Growing up in Illinois meant that fireworks were illegal. But that only made it more exciting to get our hands on some real firecrackers and stuff. Bottle rockets and firecrackers were all you really needed to have some fun. That and a lighter. 
We always had lighters because most of the adults smoked. I forgot everyone who was there, but I think it may have been my brother Frankie, cousin Joey, cousin John, and one of my friends. Or maybe Baby Al. I forgot who all was there, but I'm pretty sure Joey, John, and Frank were there, and I was there. We were down by the lake playing with firecrackers, as boys will. Lighting them, throwing them, looking for things to blow up. Then it struck one of us, I do not remember who, that we should try blowing up a frog. This proposal was generally agreed upon, so we caught a frog and put it on top of a firecracker. But when we lit the fuse, the frog jumped away, mildly scorching its legs on the fuse. We thought it was pretty funny anyway. We got another frog, and I remember helping get the frog to open his mouth. He kind of squeezed the edges of the mouth to force it open. We shoved the firecracker in real nice and set Mr. Froggy on the ground. The frog sort of just sat there, rather stupidly, with the firecracker sticking out of his fat mouth. It was kind of pathetic. I think it was the first time I ever felt sorry for a frog. Then we lit the fuse. The frog didn't move. He just sat there blinking with the smoking firecracker jauntily sticking out of his mouth like a brightly colored trick cigar. The fuse smoked and burned down to the powder. Then pop! Off it went. A few moments later, we were surprised to find that the firecracker had blown off half the frog's head. It was rather devastated by the explosion. One eye remained attached to the side of his mangled neck. It hung sadly and lifeless there as a thin trail of smoke curled its way up from the frog's neck toward heaven. Then we flipped the carcass over and discovered that the guts had gotten blown out the belly also. That was quite a sight and unexpected. The end.